You know, I stumbled across something recently that is quite interesting in how it relates to Disney as a company. For well over a year now, I've been making videos calling out the declining quality in their parks, whether it be the cheap, superficial attempts at theming, or stuff such as the reservation system or Disney Genie just wrecking their park experiences. General prices seem to always be continuously rising, and additional charges just always seem to find their way into areas where they were not present before. All of this among tired, underpaid cast members, declining park cleanliness and maintenance, and a company incapable of understanding why people visited their parks in the first place is a recipe for disaster. It is of course easy to be skeptical of that claim because profits have never been higher, and executives continue to claim that demand far outweighs what their parks can even handle. On the surface, it seems that they are correct, but I discovered a recent analysis that really articulates why I think Disney is in for a rather shocking surprise. A recent Twitter thread posted by tech insider John Bull speaks in regards to the tech industry, but I think its lesson is more broad. To summarize, John introduces the concept of what he calls the trust thermocline. By thermocline, he refers to how large bodies of water consist of different layers, where the temperature gradually decreases the further you go down. However, when you get to a certain point, the temperature then decreases suddenly and dramatically. It's an interesting metaphor, because John makes the observation that many companies will find sudden, unexpected drops in engagement and subscriptions. Again, he's speaking mostly about tech companies, but he elaborates on how much disconnect there often is from the top, chugging along with high profits, writing off the dissatisfaction of the consumer base, and then suddenly finding themselves with a huge drop-off in customers. He also makes the point that despite a lot of grumbling from users who continue to be dissatisfied with the product, they can still continue to engage with it for long periods of time, even as prices continue to increase gradually and corners continue to be cut. They will often lose trust in the company long before they actually reach the threshold where they decide to cut ties, because people typically engage with what they already know and are familiar with, even as prices rise and quality declines. However, as the company continues chipping away at their trust, that threshold will be reached, and the company will suddenly find themselves with a mass abandonment of their product. John also observes that once this happens, a company cannot just simply revert back to how they were to regain their customers. That trust has already been broken. If you've been following all of the negativity surrounding Disney over the past decade or so, I think that you'll see that this lines up. First, it was just a few things, such as adding resort parking fees or continuously bringing the prices up. However, as he was leaving, CEO Bob Iger, who was well-loved throughout his time, made a number of decisions that fed his ego and reflected his personal interests. These decisions are causing a lot of the issues that we're seeing with the company currently, not just in their parks, but in their media division as well. On top of this, he promoted Bob Chapek as his successor in 2020, a man who was already deeply unpopular with consumers. From that point forward, dramatic changes have swept the company, resulting in a continued rise in negative feedback from consumers and approaching what I believe to be the breaking point of the trust thermocline. It's difficult to say exactly what this breaking point will be, but the point of this video is to provide new perspective on these issues. I really want to knock Bob Iger down a few pegs, really showing how he set the company up for failure despite his positive reputation. Chapek, on the other hand, recently did an interview with the Wall Street Journal, really illuminating how disconnected he is from consumers. I think this interview works as an interesting lens to highlight many of the recent changes and the issues that this is causing with consumer trust. So whether you're someone who engages with Disney as a consumer, or if you have a vested interest in this company as a shareholder, let's now dive into what I believe are the increasingly clear warning signs for the rapidly approaching decline of Disney. Obviously, I would expect any company to want to make a profit. I mean, that's why they exist. Yet there comes a point where some companies get far too large, taking their positions for granted and becoming greedy, pursuing the short-term profits at the expense of their longevity. It's no secret that Disney, which was once known for being expensive but a top-tier product and experience, 
has resorted to transparently taking advantage of that public goodwill. Disney has always been different since Disneyland opened in 1955, really pushing the amusement industry forward through constant innovation and really showing the industry that you can maintain quality, cleanliness, and great guest service despite large crowds. That's a great reputation to have, but Disney also has to deserve it. At an operational level, with recent elements such as park reservations, the dreaded Disney Genie, and ridiculous price hikes everywhere despite the constant noticeable decline in quality, it's easy to view Bob Chapek as the villain. And you know what? He certainly is. However, the need to squeeze park guests so tightly is the result of a financial shadow that looms over the company. Recently, Braden over at Mickey Views has really shed some light on what has led to many of these negative changes, and that would be the 2019 acquisition of Fox for $71 billion, leaving the company with significant debt. Saying it, it's rather obvious that this is a huge financial concern for the company, but I'm inclined to think that its impact has been overshadowed by the parks and media production shutting down in 2020. Those have no doubt had their own negative impact in allowing these changes to come around as well, but it only took Braden highlighting this issue for me to identify a reckless pattern. That particular pattern would be Bob Iger and his series of vanity projects, resulting in some of the most high-profile failures in company history, yet often getting a pass because he was publicly well-liked. It's easy to see how when he took the reins of CEO in 2005, how he would be perceived as the breath of fresh air. Eisner, despite profits rising as he was ousted, was blamed for a stagnating business. It of course didn't help that he burned a lot of bridges in the industry, and often caused a lot of corporate drama, especially with Pixar. So, as that relationship seemed unsalvageable, Iger was able to come in and mend Disney's relationship with Steve Jobs, then purchasing the company in 2006. In general, I think this left a strong impression of Iger as a great negotiator, especially since he was correct in recognizing the value of Pixar. Not only were the characters right at home with the Disney brand, but at the time, Pixar seemed like a studio that was incapable of producing a bad film. As Disney also wanted to journey into 3D animation, the assets and expertise of Pixar would be essential to them as well. From this point forward, Iger would become known as a negotiator who would make smart acquisitions, allowing Disney to grow beyond its reputation for hand-drawn animation. Iger would then purchase Marvel in 2009 and Lucasfilm in 2012. We of course know that Fox would come in 2019. However, where things seemed great throughout the decade until the events of 2020, problems would start to appear, which in retrospect show a trend. Pixar itself is a great brand to have under the Disney umbrella, but as it has continued to spend more time there, it has lost much of its creative independence. These days, while I still regard Pixar pretty highly, its films are no longer consistent, often being rather hit or miss. It's also clear that Disney leadership didn't really trust Pixar as a brand to sell tickets to the theater, instead emphasizing sequels and treating new franchises as increasingly undesirable. I mean, think about the last few years, where films such as Soul, Luca, and Turning Red went directly to Disney+, Plus, when Disney-branded animated films such as Encanto released in theaters. Obviously, due to the 2020 shutdowns and the shock to the theater industry, Disney naturally wanted to push people to its streaming service. However, it has been made clear that Disney no longer trusts the Pixar name to sell seats in theaters, with their only recent theatrical release being Lightyear, which obviously didn't do very well despite the popular name. There is also an issue of Disney animation and Pixar now blending together and blurring the lines between brands, such as marketing Merida from Brave as a Disney princess, or having no visual distinction between the films of both studios. At this point, Pixar maintains its identity but it is slowly disappearing, which I think is very much a mistake. When most moviegoers only see a few movies a year, they may skip out on an animated Disney musical, but might instead be enticed by the more mature writing of Pixar. Yet, when the studios become homogenized and Pixar becomes another mediocre sequel machine, you've essentially eliminated one of your strongest and most distinct brands. I also find that Iger got lucky with Marvel, because nobody at the time could have anticipated that they would have become the most profitable studio in Hollywood. His acquisition was very much a gamble, and in my opinion, he's given a lot of credit for foresight that likely wasn't there. And Star Wars? The fiasco of the sequel trilogy and the damaging of the brand has been spoken about to an inescapable degree. 
Star Wars in itself shows how little Iger understood that simply acquiring a brand, no matter how strong, wasn't a guaranteed profit. To run out of the gate with a film that's poorly written, relying on nostalgia to sell tickets may have worked once. Still, a brand as strong as Star Wars was damaged through the sloppy writing and poor direction of those left in charge, showing that brand isn't simply strong enough on its own without actual creative people taking risks. Further issues would be present in Disney's live-action productions. Films such as Tron Legacy, Tomorrowland, A Wrinkle in Time, or The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, among many others, would either make meager returns or bomb entirely. The previous two parts of the Caribbean films would make money, but were themselves so bad that Disney was working off of thin goodwill from audiences. With Disney's live-action films, things have not gone well at all over the last decade, other than the live-action remakes of the animated classics. Even then though, that's a pretty limited library to pull from. It's not like Disney is going to remake Oliver and Company or The Black Cauldron. Time is running out in this division until Disney becomes desperate enough to bring in actual creatives, or tries their hand in a different direction, as they've attempted to do with Jungle Cruise or the upcoming Haunted Mansion film. So again, Disney was quite profitable during this time, despite all the issues which still persist today. Pixar is treated like dirt, Disney isn't confident enough to produce a new Star Wars film anytime soon, and Disney's live-action division continues to consistently lose money unless it's a remake from an increasingly smaller pool. The point I'm making is that I think that the studio is on borrowed time. Iger may have been a great negotiator, but the cracks in his acquisitions are becoming quite apparent. Still, throughout the last decade, he was well-liked by Disney fans and shareholders alike, seen as an incredible CEO for the company. In retrospect though, I think that his perceived success really got into his head. Towards the end of the decade, he would personally engage in a number of high-profile projects that have now been a colossal waste of money, resulting in many of the concerning issues we see going forward. So real quick, if you made it this far into the video, I assume that you probably agree with what I'm saying. I obviously make money from videos, but I also see them as a platform to influence cultural narratives and sway the conversation in such a way as to hold companies accountable for their poor practices and management. If you agree with me, then you can also do me a favor by hitting the like button or sharing the video. I think it's also important to highlight these issues because I hope to influence the cultural narrative surrounding Disney before they actually reach the so-called trust thermocline. From this point though, let me ask, do you remember the NBA experience? You know, the building that replaced Disney Quest at Disney Springs and was open for less than a year? This was obviously an expensive project, demolishing the old building and erecting a new one just to have it be left abandoned as a financial failure. One could argue that the shutdown of 2020 was unfortunate timing, but it was pretty well known that this place struggled even before that point. The NBA experience is a good introduction to the vanity of Iger, and that it was very much a passion project of his that was also very much not in line with Disney consumers. Iger himself seems to be a pretty vocal basketball fan, and at the time, I recall seeing speculation that this was built because Iger wanted to create connections in the industry. The end result would be him possibly buying a basketball team of his own once he retired from Disney. Hosting the end of the 2020 NBA season at Walt Disney World seems to confirm this as well. Still, I don't really need to get into why the NBA experience failed. It was essentially just a basketball-themed arcade, which, while an interesting successor to Disney Quest in a way, was just a bit too niche to be successful. From the start, the NBA experience was perplexing to everyone outside of the project, but if you view it through Iger's own personal interests, wanting to make inroads in the industry for his own personal gain, it starts to make more sense. It's not a great scenario, and the building was inevitably quite expensive, but it's just one minor project, right? Well, I'm of the opinion that the failure of this experience really highlights a trend. Chapek gets a lot of flack for the mess that is the Epcot overhaul, as it was announced when he was head of Parks and Resorts but the last few years have revealed that it, too, is very much an Iger vanity project. 
Still, when you really think about it though, it starts to make a lot of sense. For example, the cancel building that was labeled as the Festival Center was apparently Iger's idea to solidify his legacy, and the concept art even included what looks to be an area for news anchors. If you were not previously aware, Iger started his career in 1972 as a weatherman in Ithaca, professing that he eventually wanted to become a news anchor. However, two years later, he would find himself at ABC, where he would work his way up to president over the course of the next two decades. From there, he was promoted to CEO in 1994, and Disney would then purchase ABC the following year, bringing Iger into their fold. As he left Disney, he then did an interview on KABC and went back to his roots, delivering a weather report one final time. You can see him geeking out, happy to have the opportunity to experience something like this again, and I won't fault him on his niche interest. However, it's clear from just this piece of concept art alone that the Epcot overhaul reflected his own personal interest, with the rest of it just throwing in IP just for the sake of doing so. It's certainly true that a lot of expensive investment went into the park with the addition of Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and Guardians of the Galaxy, but did this actually help the park at all? Is spending five years with the center of Epcot as a creator of dirt, and then slowly peeling away the construction walls for a generic airport terminal, really worth all of this money? Is this glorified children's walkthrough attraction, or going back on the plans and sort of rebuilding what was already there before, worth the investment? The Epcot overhaul was a failed project from the start, even if other aspects such as the Play Pavilion and the Mary Poppins flat ride hadn't been cancelled. The issue is that it was part misguided passion project of Iger, part cynical corporate synergy, destroying the theme of the park in favor of merchandise sales. A long time ago, I quoted former Imagineer Joe Rohde in another video, but I would like to summarize and reiterate his message, which I will post a link to in my citations page. The essence of what he said is that fun can be had anywhere, so why would people pay high prices to enter a theme park? Well, people pay these prices because they appreciate that attention to detail, that attention to making a place thematically satisfying. Theme parks are not just simply fun, but are meaningful relationships between audiences and designers. As Epcot continues to stumble through this overhaul, it has become clear that it has been an enormous waste of money, destroying the optimistic World's Fair theme in favor of superficial IP tie-ins, and people definitely pick up on that. I can say that anecdotally, it has become clear to me that Epcot is a place that people don't want to be unless they're buying food. When you have two brand new expensive attractions in the park, I overhear people complain that they want to leave and go to either Magic Kingdom or Hollywood Studios, but can't do so because of the reservation system. More on the issues with that later, but it's clear that many people are at Epcot not because it's a place that interests them, but because there was no availability for the other parks. It has now become a place to wait around until they can leave, and meanwhile, it gives Disney management misguided statistics on the popularity of the park, justifying their claim that these attractions are successful investments in raising park attendance. I have a feeling that within the next decade, despite all of the money spent on it, Disney leadership is going to continue facing pressure to fix the park, pouring more money into it, but not understanding why it fails to fix any of its issues. So, do you see the trend of Iger's misguided vanity projects becoming expensive mistakes? Well, now it has come to its final moment. As a masterful negotiator with a great public reputation, Iger saw his opportunity to leave the company with his most expensive and valuable acquisition yet, 20th Century Fox. Disney had diversified its film library, acquiring Pixar and boosting its Disney animation division with their digital technology. Marvel and Star Wars would sit in their library to bring in a different type of audience, and now Iger had the opportunity to acquire a studio which would allow Disney to make smarter, more adult films to capture another market. In addition to this, iconic IP from decades of Fox films would now fall under Disney control. So, Disney announced its intention to purchase Fox for a deal of $52 billion. In a surprise twist, Comcast upped them with a bid of $65 billion then driving the price up as Disney retaliated with the final $71 billion. So, with an unexpected $20 billion increase, was this acquisition worth it to Disney, or did this just play to Iger's ego as a master negotiator? 
Well, I can say that Disney's IP acquisitions have been quite underutilized. The Simpsons is something that they threw on Disney+, Plus, along with a decent handful of family films. It also gives them leverage over Comcast when it comes time to renegotiate their deal with the inclusion of The Simpsons in the Universal Parks. Otherwise though, the IP acquisitions have either been wasted or were weak to begin with. Animated franchises such as Ice Age or television brands such as National Geographic aren't exactly the strongest properties. There is otherwise a lack of strong live-action franchises as well, perhaps with the exception of Alien. Once Fox fell under the Disney banner, it was renamed to 20th Century Studios, and has since only released a small handful of movies, all of which did pretty poorly and were dumped into theaters as they attempted to reopen from the 2020 shutdown. Going forward, their slate of upcoming films is pretty slim and generally uninteresting. It could be argued that acquiring the Avatar franchise may be beneficial, but certainly not enough to offset how underutilized everything else is. Even then, we don't know if the franchise will continue to be successful. Other people may chime in and talk about the Marvel properties that Fox had the rights to, but I'm inclined to think that those rights would have gone back to Marvel and thus Disney anyways if Fox had been sold to anyone else. So, on the studio front, Disney isn't seeing much benefit, at least not for the price. However, as Disney Plus launched the same year, I think that the Fox acquisition was generally seen as an investment in what is now the growing industry of streaming. First, the deal would allow Disney to gain a controlling stake in Hulu of 66%, with the other 33% already being owned by Comcast. Second, the extensive library of Fox films would allow Disney to pad out Disney Plus and add additional content to Hulu, although again, I'm not sure if there's much value there. Third was that Disney would own Sky TV, which would give Disney significant infrastructure in Western Europe, allowing them to easily bring Disney Plus to consumers there when streaming was shaping up to be the future of media distribution, thereby giving Disney a huge advantage in that area of the world. The problem, though, is that Disney never actually acquired Sky as part of the deal. What makes this complicated is that Fox was in the process of acquiring Sky, as Disney then put in its bid to acquire Fox. Through a series of complicated events, it was Comcast that eventually owned Sky after winning a blind bid in 2018. So that's pretty embarrassing, especially since Iger was quoted as having described Sky as the crown jewel of Fox's assets. Not only did Comcast drive up the price of Fox to a ridiculous sum, but they also denied Disney the primary reason for even considering the deal in the first place. Still, the issues don't stop there. As part of Comcast's attempt to also purchase a controlling stake in Hulu, they reached a deal with Disney in 2019. This odd deal guaranteed that Comcast would instead sell its stake to Disney as early as 2024, with an agreed-upon minimum value of $27.5 billion. So, in total, the Fox acquisition will have cost Disney just under $100 billion by 2024, and what value have they actually gotten out of this deal? Certainly not much, and as stated earlier, massive debt looms over this company with much more to come. It's clear that Iger made a massive mistake, and having been manipulated by Comcast into paying a much higher price for the least useful assets, I'm surprised that this narrative around Iger hasn't taken hold. It's clear to me that he shouldn't be as highly regarded as he was, and I hope I've illustrated that his stupid, wasteful mistakes were ultimately vanity projects that furthered his own personal interests. If you've been watching for a while, you know that I've had quite a bit to say about the leadership of Bob Chapek. However, a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal really reveals how out of touch he is with Disney consumers. I want you to keep that in mind as I comment on some of his more interesting statements here. Around seven minutes into the interview, he has this to say. Because people have such a deep, founded relationship with Disney. Yeah. I mean, th they love this company. A and. And, they, and frankly, they don't even look at it as a company. They look at it as a, 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 a utility. They look at it as something that's 
part of their lives. Yeah, part that, of their identity. Really, yeah, part of their ways. identity. Yeah. And, you know, that's great. We need to embrace that. But it also puts extra pressure on us because they don't think of us as a company. And when we do things that normal companies might do, you know, sometimes it, it creates a friction because all of a sudden they're like, well, well, well why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah. But of course, we have shareholders that have different expectations. So one of the pleasures of my job is trying to balance <laughs> yeah. all the different constituencies and uh, especially with a brand like Disney. So he is definitely correct, and this ties into something they discussed earlier in the interview, and that Disney has been labeled as a lifestyle brand. Disney is a company that has permeated culture in such a way as to become a well-left staple of American middle-class comfort, especially through their media division and merchandise. In regards to the parks, Disneyland's from the beginning was aptly identified as a symbol of American culture, choosing to pursue nostalgia, American history, and reflecting popular television and film genres of the time. Since then, the park's brand has continued to embrace larger cultural appeal. Epcot highlighted human diversity and tried to inspire guests to create a better future. Disney MGM Studios was probably the most commercial of these parks, but still made an effort to celebrate cinema. Animal Kingdom had many messages and deep cultural ties, but emphasized conservation and exploring relationships between people and animals. Even California Adventure, as flawed as it was, made interesting choices in how it engaged with Californian culture. However, as Iger took the reins, the parks would devolve away from this. They became vessels to promote popular media franchises, and while this in itself is of course an expression of culture, it has continued to become increasingly surface level as the themes of the parks are destroyed, and they become homogenized retail locations. Something else interesting to note is how Chapek speaks about balancing the wants of consumers and shareholders. What he makes clear is that he fails to understand that you can satisfy your customers while still producing significant profits. Keep that in mind for now. With that being said though, let's move into a different area where he reveals how misguided he is. Absolutely, part of the lifestyle brand is using Disney Plus, not as a movie server service, but using it as a platform for experiential Disney uh, uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we have ambition to use Disney Plus way beyond just a movie service. So what JPEG is alluding to is Disney in the metaverse. I'm certainly not a tech expert, but the metaverse seems like a desperate attempt to change course after Facebook realized it was becoming a damaged product and started losing users. Tying this back into the trust thermocline, while Facebook is still used by a large portion of the population, it has become clear that it's going to continue losing users for the foreseeable future, especially with such a poor reputation among the public. It's certainly possible that Facebook too may see a sudden exodus, and I think that their pivot towards the metaverse indicates that they share this concern as well. There's a whole host of issues with Meta and Facebook that I won't get into here, but I'm inclined to think that the metaverse is at best a gimmick, something that will never make any meaningful impact on the lives of American consumers. Furthermore, the public perception of Meta is quite negative, even if their product was any good or had any positive potential. There continues to be a growing rebellion against social media and excessive screen time, so how does Meta think its virtual reality gimmick can really be the future? Regardless, I think it's smart for Disney to want to get into this from the beginning, because despite my skepticism, you never know when an industry will suddenly change, and it's good to stay a step ahead. However, the folly here is how set JPEG seems on really diving into this, because it certainly isn't the first time that he has emphasized turning Disney into an online product. If I recall correctly, I believe JPEG previously expressed interest in developing a virtual reality theme park and transforming Disney Plus into some sort of virtual space that he labeled as a lifestyle platform. It's an interesting idea that I'm sure is also a gimmick, designed to utilize microtransactions to purchase digital nonsense. Who would want to put on a virtual reality headset to experience what would likely be a shallow, misguided experience? when Disney could instead be working with a video game developer for something more substantial. Even then, a virtual space will always fail to live up to the reality of an actual, tangible themed space. Speaking of monetizing the internet though, Chapek is later asked about something that he has gotten a lot of criticism for recently, 
which is his desire to get Disney into the business of sports betting through ESPN+. This is what he has to say about it. Once again, that will be up to the consumers, and the consumers, particularly the younger under 35 consumers, are telling us that they want a robust lean forward sports experience, not maybe, you know, their grandfather's lean back type sports experience. And so we're looking at all different options in terms of how we can deliver on that guest and consumer expectation of a lean forward sports experience. I like how he puts responsibility on consumers rather than himself for influencing the direction of the Disney brand. If you know anything about Disney, historically it has always lobbied pretty hard to keep gambling illegal in Florida. Earlier in the interview, Chapek spoke about how surprised he was at how elastic the Disney brand continued to be, though. For example, I remember when Pirates of the Caribbean came out, there was a lot of buzz about whether it was appropriate for Disney to release a PG-13 rated film. Today though, with additions such as Deadpool to Disney+, Plus, I think that Chapek is very much correct in saying that Disney's brand is pretty elastic. However, I think that sports betting might be taking things a bit too far. For all of the importance of brand to Chapek, he certainly doesn't seem to recognize that Disney is at its strongest as an entertainment company. By branching out into weird industries such as gambling or virtual reality, it almost seems to come at the neglect of their strongest assets. Still, I think he has worse brand issues to think about. In a world where we don't control demand, you're left with one of two situations. You either let way too many people into the park where they don't have a great experience, or you manage it by just turning people way at the gate. Now imagine if you're a family from Seattle and you come to Disneyland, you come for a two or three day stay, you're there at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're turned away because we won't let too many people in the park. We developed a reservation system so people would know ahead of time whether they were going to get in or not. And then... Imagine being a family from Seattle, coming to Disneyland and being turned away at the gate because you didn't know that you would need a reservation to even get in. As you're told this, you look and see that no reservations are available for the rest of your stay. Imagine all that, and then seeing the CEO of the company talking about a scenario that never actually happened previous to the reservation system, except on the busiest of holidays, but now occurs far more frequently because of this system. Chapek loves to pretend that he cares about the consumers, claiming that it leads to smaller crowds and therefore a better park experience. Still, this anti-consumer practice does nothing but cause frustration and make visiting these parks a headache. So what's the benefit? It certainly doesn't stop Disney from letting in massive, oppressive crowds, but what it does allow them to do is cut staffing to the bare minimum based on how the reservation system indicates crowd levels will be. By doing this, ride operations are slower and park cleanliness is done to the bare minimum to save on staffing costs. This anecdote was also shared with me through someone else, so I didn't say it for myself, but I heard that the reservation system has something to do with food supply as well. The story, as I recall, is that a cast member at Cosmic Rewind in Epcot shared that they and other cast members would often go into Connections Cafe for food on their breaks. However, they were eventually barred from doing so because the reservation system determined how much product that the restaurant would need to order on any given day. Because this was done to the bare minimum, these cast members, as few as they were, would mess with the operations of the restaurant and deny food to the guests. I can certainly see the merit in not wasting food, but this clearly isn't why this system exists. It's all about cutting park costs to an almost unsustainable minimum, overworking their underpaid cast members, and creating a stressful, restrictive mess for the people attempting to even be there. Remember how I made that point earlier about how few people actually wanted to be at Epcot, expressing that they were just waiting to go somewhere else? Among the declining operations of the park also comes a declining creative experience as well. Vice versa, when you're in a park, we should know what your viewing habits are on Disney Plus, again, assuming that you give us the permission and the ability to use that data in that way. But once that happens, we've now brought your entire Disney existence into a place where we can give you a better experience in the park because we know what your preferences are in terms of viewing and a better experience on Disney Plus because we know what your affinities are and what your behavior More is. More tailored. What exactly does this mean? Is that how he really believes people think? Does someone walk into Magic Kingdom and exclaim, 
wow, look at all these different brands, and then choose the ones that they like best? That's not how this works at all, and this really continues to illustrate how out of touch JPEG is with people who come to the parks. They come to have a full day experience, riding most rides, and seeing most shows. Yet JPEG makes the claim that based on your preferences at the park, Disney Plus can then recommend content to you in a more personalized, customizable way. The interviewer then presses him on what exactly this means, and asks what happens if he rides Pirates of the Caribbean. Chapek's answer is essentially that Disney Plus knows that you rode the ride, so it will then recommend the movies to you. It's obviously a stupid answer, and I suspect that Chapek is hiding his intention to also include some weird metaverse angle to this. But again, that's not why people come to theme parks. They don't come for corporate IP synergy. They come to experience something atmospheric and transformative, immersing you into unique experiences in a physical space that you cannot find elsewhere. Virtual reality or watching a film with some relation to an attraction is not the same as actually being in a well-designed park. If I really wanted to watch Beauty and the Beast, I would just stay home and do that, not go to Epcot and watch a derivative sing-along. It's clear that JPEG knows there's massive demand for the parks, but doesn't actually understand why. Here's another clip that further reveals this. If you think about the nature of why people have great Disney memories, remember the end benefit is memories, magical memories that last a lifetime. The reason they have those, yeah, it's about the castle, and yeah, it's about the great attractions, or they really enjoyed that churro on Main Street, but really what they remember more than anything is gas, guest cast interactions. Mm. And so if that's the secret sauce for making those magical memories, when I ran parks for, gosh, I don't know what it was, like seven years, almost, I would say 99% of the letters I got were about guest cast interactions, not about attractions. Literally, it was almost every single one. So if that's the key to a great guest experience, and we're all about the guest and the audience and maximizing their experience, then you have to make sure that the cast is at the center of everything that you do. So, so. First, don't pretend that you care about the cast when you treat them like dirt. Second, you clearly don't care about the guest experience when you implemented the reservation system, wreck the lines with Disney Genie, and continue charging higher prices while letting the parks fall apart. Third, you still continue to show that you don't understand why people are coming. Friendly and helpful staff are certainly highlights, but the culture is to leave feedback for them, not the parks. That positive feedback for the parks themselves is the admission price that people are willing to pay to even be there. You said it's not the castle, but it literally is. These parks were places that once meant something, and the quality of their experiences is what draws people in. If we change, you know, an attraction, you know, from Tower of Terror to Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> you know, while wow, the lines went from 30 minutes long to six hours yeah, long. Yeah, but, but they would come after you. First, that's just not true. Tower of Terror was and still is a popular attraction. Mission Breakouts doesn't really pull higher wait times than the Tower of Terror ever did. Second, if IP is so important to the guests, why is Galaxy's Edge considered to be the quiet area of Disneyland? Why is New Orleans Square, containing attractions from the 1960s, still the most popular area of the park? Why is Fast and Furious Supercharged at Universal, based on one of the most profitable film franchises of all time, not very well received or popular? The point I'm making is that you can't just slap an IP onto something and claim that it results in people going wild. Mission Breakout is a fun, decent free theme. It's as simple as that. If you build interesting, well-designed attractions, people will still come as evidenced by decades of Disney parks leading the industry, long before IP attractions became mandatory. So, these are just some interesting points that I thought I should highlight from the interview, hopefully reinforcing my point that JPEG is radically out of touch with Disney consumers. However, I would like to now tie everything together, returning back to how Disney has continued to betray consumer trust, and why the company could suddenly find themselves in a crisis.
Right, so let's review on how Iger left the company. During his run, he acquired Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars. Pixar continues to lose its distinct brand identity, and Disney is still quite hesitant to start developing another Star Wars film. Even Marvel, despite still looking relatively strong, has received a lot of criticism for its inconsistent quality and oversaturation of content recently. On top of this, Disney's live-action film division has been treading water for a decade now. Their only real successes were remakes of well-loved animated films, which they are quickly running out of. In many ways, Iger's acquisitions of these companies has been great for the Disney brand overall, especially in exploring new media on Disney+, Plus as the home entertainment market continues to move towards streaming. However, it's simply not enough to just buy your way into strong brands. You really need to work to maintain them. However great to negotiate or Iger was though, I still maintain that it went to his head, and his own personal interests became a little too intertwined with business decisions, leading to a lot of messes that are still currently affecting the company. I think I've illustrated how the Epcot overhaul is a misguided vanity project, further damaging the park it intended to fix. On top of this, Iger's most prolific folly is the Fox acquisition, leaving Disney with significant debt for a studio with little value to them. It's also embarrassing how Comcast drove up the price, while also stealing the most valuable asset of the deal after it was too late for Disney to back out. So when it looked like the world was about to enter a catastrophe in 2020, Iger suddenly, without warning, appointed Chapek as his successor, which obviously has put the company in a worse position. Remember how I made the point earlier that JPEG doesn't actually know how to balance the interests of the consumers and the shareholders? For decades, the Disney parks made massive profits because they were seen as unique, exceptional products with unrivaled guest service. I look at recent projects such as the Riviera Resort, the new Polynesian DVC Tower, and wonder how the company has fallen so far. You know, Disney was known for the theming of its resorts. So how did it get into the business of emulating Hilton hotels with cartoons thrown in? Why are we seeing attractions such as Slinky Dog Dash, taking a generic roller coaster and slapping an IP onto it as if Six Flags had built it? That's not a comparison I should have to ever make with the once untouchable industry leader. The fact is, is that their themed entertainment has declined in creativity and often at the expense of more interesting attractions. That brings up another point in that this is a company with leadership that claims it has unprecedented demand, yet absolutely refuses to add capacity to its parks. It's easy to do the bare minimum to meet the lowest bar of guest satisfaction, reducing attraction capacity to save on maintenance costs. Let me remind you that Hollywood Studios, after many years of bloated, overpriced construction, still only has 9 rides in the entire park. So how does Disney address this? Well, they price people out with continuous price increases in conjunction with a reservation system, allowing them to cut their labor costs to a minimum. Still though, the list goes on. Perks, such as the Magical Express or any kind of meaningful extra hours in the parks for hotel guests, were cut despite rising rates. Food quality has dipped among restaurants all across Disney property, many of them switching to prefix menus to mass produce food and flip tables at lightning speed. Park cleanliness and ride maintenance is noticeably down, leaving some attractions barely operating. I could keep going on, but there's one last major element I want to include in all of this. At most theme parks you visit, a skip-the-line system will typically be offered. Across the industry, the standard for this is to charge a steep price, often more than the entry ticket itself. By doing so, it prices out a lot of people who feel it is too expensive, which results in sales being low and having a minimal effect on standby queues which continue to move consistently. This is great in that if you really want to splurge to skip the lines you can do so, but it doesn't come at the cost of the experience of other people. Disney fully well knows this as it is the industry standard, and yet Disney Genie was purposefully designed to absolutely wreck their queues to generate additional income. The way that this occurs is through the low price point. Obviously, when the park is busy, many guests will consider buying the service because the price is so manageable. However, Chapek has made it clear on earnings calls in the past that, on a frequent basis, over half of the park guests are purchasing this service on any given day. So, if you're waiting in a standby line, 
it's going to move at a snail's pace because hundreds of people are going to be given priority ahead of you. Often, these lines themselves get backed up, leading essentially to two lines, one of which is paid and the other which is not. Seeing this, other people will decide that they too don't want to wait in these long, artificially inflated lines, therefore purchasing Disney Genie for themselves and making the problem worse. However, when so many people have purchased the service and with such a small pool of return times available, they aren't really getting much value out of it. Perhaps you wanted to ride Big Thunder Mountain, but all the return times are taken up for the day. Perhaps you wanted to ride the Haunted Mansion, but those are gone as well. So having paid for the service but not seeing much value, people will pick up whatever is left. This results in attractions, such as the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, now having hour plus waits when they never did prior. When Disney was using the old system of FastPass Plus, which was free, people weren't grabbing those return times for this attraction because they didn't feel the need to justify the cost of a purchase. So not only do people almost feel forced to pay for Disney Genie to even have some degree of fun, but when they do, they'll find that they're not actually getting much value out of it. Perhaps you'll get lucky and get something like Space Mountain, but it's mostly going to be in less desirable attractions. Hopefully, I've illustrated how predatory Disney Genie is designed to be. Through its low cost, it encourages a lot of buyers, wrecking the standby queues and making the experience so miserably slow that it encourages even more people to purchase it. Yet, when they do, it doesn't even provide much value to them anyways, especially since Disney's parks continue to exist as underbuilt. Now of course, Chapek would probably frame this as customizing the experience for consumers, but it's clear that it's meant to maximize profits by making it feel almost necessary in order to have anything other than a miserable time. So, as the park experience rapidly declines and it feels as if you are constantly bombarded by upcharges as the quality of food, merchandise, and traction maintenance continues to slip, this of course affects consumer trust. The Disney parks were once known as exceptional experiences, full of meaningful attraction design and world-class service. Yet, that's clearly not the case anymore, with a company dedicated to building pandering, intellectually shallow IP rides and meanwhile, reaping record profits by implementing systems that make the experience miserable. Again, I could continue going on with more issues, but the point I would like to make is that just so many things all at once, and this is where the trust thermocline comes back into the conversation. If you recall, John makes the claim that many consumers will continue their relationship with the company long after it has lost their trust, and so the companies themselves are often shocked when their consumers suddenly drop off. Another point he also made that I didn't touch on though, is that many companies are disconnected from consumers in a different manner. They tend to operate with the idea that as long as demand keeps climbing, they could continue raising prices and cutting more corners. When they start to lose customers though, their plan is of course to lower prices and bring back whatever was cut. Disney has made it pretty clear that this is their plan, using tools such as small discounts or bringing back annual pass sales as a possibility if they see declining revenue. However, when you burn consumer trust and there is a deep drop-off, that just isn't going to work. They've already decided that you aren't worth their time or money, no matter what you do. John also makes the observation that if there isn't competition, many of these companies often feel that they are safe from this consumer drop-off as well. What's interesting about this is that Disney very much does have competition with Universal Orlando, yet they act as if they don't. Recently though, there definitely has been an uptick in popularity there. When their public numbers reflect this, and anecdotally, when I'm hearing travel agents talk about a sudden spike in interest from people who never would have previously considered it, I think that the warning signs are clear. Universal Parks have shown that they are willing to make meaningful investment in interesting, exciting attractions in their parks all throughout the world, and it gives me a lot of confidence that their new park, Epic Universe, will be quite impactful when it opens in 2025. It's not just that this park will be a strong offering though. What's also important is that it changes people's perceptions of the resort overall. As they have continued expanding hotel offerings, now offer Volcano Bay as an excellent water park, and now have three world-class theme parks that continue to see meaningful investment, it really elevates Universal as a multi-day destination, and not just a side trip to a mostly Disney-focused vacation. 
With Universal, you can just walk into whichever park you want, get great service, have a great time, and not worry about the express line wrecking how quickly you move. Now of course, Universal has its fair share of issues, but I actively see changes in the parks to try to resolve them. I'm also not really going to get into this here because I've already done an extensive video discussing it, but Universal also benefits from having a huge entertainment district stuck right between both parts of its resort when the new park and its surrounding hotels will open. Obviously, they will be missing out on some of that money, but I think it shifts the center of attention to this area of Orlando as a massive entertainment hub where visitors can spend a multi-day vacation seeing what it has to offer. That in itself will also transform how people perceive Universal as a destination, which should only help to boost their attendance. So, as Disney continues to really push consumers around, breaching their trust and ignoring their competition, I think that they will eventually see that shocking drop-off in attendance. With that being said, however, it won't be anytime soon. It's one thing for users to leave Facebook or Twitter, but another for people to leave Disney when they plan years ahead to save money to visit. I think it's pretty clear why this can create the perception that Disney is doing fine, but when those people return home and tell everyone they know that the experience just isn't worth it, it breaks that saving cycle, which is when I believe Disney will be in trouble. A lot of people have wondered, if the experience is so bad, why is attendance so high? Well, that's what I suspect is the reason behind those numbers. So, as the Disney brand continues to be damaged at an alarming rate, the company is stuck with paying off massive debt, its studios are working on borrowed time, and Universal is becoming a much stronger competitor in Orlando, how is Chapek responding to this? Well, that would be with sports betting and transforming Disney Plus into a lifestyle platform of the metaverse, whatever that's supposed to mean. So, if you've made it this far into the video, I assume that I've kept you interested with the points I'm making. Once again, you can help me influence the narrative around Disney by simply sharing the video, or even doing something as simple as leaving a like. Yeah, obviously I also personally benefit, but judge how you will. As always though, if you enjoy deep dives into the theme park industry like this, I recommend subscribing and hitting the bell icon so as to be notified to new videos as they release.